Dr. Ranjana Srivastava. Uh, Ranjana is a medical oncologist and internist from Melbourne, Australia, who graduated from Monash University and did her internship residency and specialty training at various Melbourne hospitals. In 2004, uh, Ranjana won a Fulbright uh, Award, uh, which she uh, completed at the University of Chicago. In 2014, Ranjana was recognized by Monash University as, as their Distinguished alumnus of the of the uh, alumna of the year, um, uh, Ranjan is the author of a number of books. Her most recent book, A Cancer Companion: An Oncologist's Advice on Diagnosis, Treatment, and Recovery, was brought out this year by the University of Chicago Press. Ranjan is also a regular columnist for the Guardian newspaper, uh, and in that regard, is re reaches hundreds of thousands of people, um, where she writes on humanity and ethics in medicine. Uh, Ranjan presents a regular health segment on Australian television. Um, we'll be returning to the University of Chicago uh, to work with us in the summer intensive program in July of 2016. Uh, today, Ranjana will speak on the topic on making a difference one paragraph at a time from oncologist to guardian columnist. Ranjana Shrestha. Good afternoon. Thank you for, for staying and uh, curbing your appetite for lunch. I'll try to, uh, try to entertain you. Um, very different tone from some of the talks that have followed. And in fact, sometimes I do wonder what I'm doing here amongst all you intellectual heavyweights. Uh, but um, Mark asked me to talk about my writing. And I thought I would take you on a journey um, of uh, oncology to writing, and I continue to be an oncologist, but sort of a potted history to how I got to become a writer and, and what I make of it and, and what I see. Picture to familiarize you, I'm from Melbourne, Australia, Australian Tennis Open, Sydney Opera House. If you ever come to Australia, look me up. <laughs> when I was a medical student, uh, in fact, when I was a resident, an oncology resident, um, I should preface this by saying that I feel like my whole life I've been stumbling upon things and my life, my career certainly hasn't been the kind of deliberate consequential career that, that is the envy of many people including my own. So when I was a medical student and, and following that uh, an oncology fellow, I took some time out from my training and I went to India which was a place where I had grown up. In fact, I grew up in Patna, uh, Bihar which is uh, Peter Singer showed some slides of. Um, and I went there to work with Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity. I had sort of stumbled upon them as a, as a volunteer organization where I could go. Um, and I worked with them on the street side clinics of Calcutta. And it was one of those experiences, I think, that would, uh, that would have a really remarkable effect on me. But at the time, uh, I, I didn't necessarily uh, make as much of it as I do now, 20 years or 15 years later. Followed by that, throughout, through my training, I took some, uh, in fact, during my oncology training, I, this is, sorry, this is a picture of the hospice at, at the Missionaries of Charity, uh, as you can see, very basic, um, run by volunteers, and a most um, moving and, uh, and, and life-changing experience, really, for me and for many other people who work there. I came back from Calcutta and I found myself um, volunteering at the Asylum Seeker Resource Center when I was an oncology fellow and we got a few hours off every week. Uh, this center had just opened. I can't for the life of me remember how I, um, how I stumbled upon it. I certainly wasn't necessarily looking to work with refugees. Um, and very soon found this most extraordinary uh, sort of um, place which was about 20 minutes from a first world, world class hospital looking after a vulnerable population right there in Melbourne, Australia. And the juxtaposition was just incredible. Um, you know, back at my hospital, which I work at during the week, I could literally spend hundreds and thousands, even millions of dollars on cancer therapies and drugs without 
people looking over my shoulder too much. And at this asylum seeker center, I would struggle to find antihypertensives. I would struggle to give someone an asthma a uh, pump, um, a little child broke his, uh, broke his uh, a, a bone once on a playground, and Australia at the time had very restrictive policies that um, refugees and asylum seekers were not allowed access to Medicare, which is our universal healthcare system. Um, and I struggled to find this little boy a place to go to get an x-ray, to get emergency treatment. And I think those things, you know, you. Perhaps you expect them in another world, in a third world country, but you don't expect them in, in Melbourne. You don't expect them in Australia. And I found that very confronting. And I was, I was, a, I was a young fellow at the time, and, and so continued to work there. So something very interesting happened, and I think it kind of, this is where my non-academic career uh, probably started. So as an oncology, um, Fellow, sorry, I should go back. So this is this is another picture of the uh, of the refugees, uh, uh, refugees and asylum seekers in Australia. Although many of them have Medicare rights now, they're detained under very uh, severe circumstances, um, and 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 that. And I'll talk talk a little bit more to that later on. But it's very troubling. It's troubling to. A lot of people, including doctors, who sometimes treat these children when they're, or, or I don't treat children personally, uh, who are brought to hospital and then taken back to detention. So all this started a very interesting conversation with my then bosses, who kind of asked me, you know, where my career was heading. Um, and, and you know, I worked, I worked at a at an academic institution, much like much like this one. And I and I said to several people that you know I'd been working at the Asylum Seeker Centre and found the whole issue very confronting. And and I said to um, to a fairly eminent um, academic, I said, I think I'm going to write about the refugees. And he looks at me, and his entire expression changes. He says, What? And I said, oh, I'm going I'm to write. I'm going to write about the stuff we see. You know, look, look at this. It doesn't make sense to have so much inequality within several kilometers of where we work. And I'll never forget, he said, well, that's not going to get you published in the New England Journal of Medicine. <laughs> and I thought, well, there I go. You know, I have failed even before I started. So, you know, isn't that the holy grail of medicine, you know, to publish in the New England Journal? So I started my career as an oncologist, sort of knowing that I wasn't heading down the academic track, knowing that I would never publish in the New England Journal of Medicine, and kind of on my own, wanting to become a writer, but very much loving medicine. And I'm very passionate about medicine. I love what I do. Um, so then I finished my oncology training and, and came to another sort of uh, crossroad. Do you do further training? Do you do a PhD? Do you, you know, do you try to pursue some research project, if nothing else, to get some more letters after your name and to get a job in a decent hospital? Uh, or, or do you sort of follow your heart and, and see what happens? So although I have, um, so essentially, you know, how do you get, are there different ways of getting to the same point? And the point, I suppose, if we all remember those of us who went to medical school and, and you attend an interview and people say, well, why do you want to study medicine? And I guess inevitably in some way or the other, we all say to make a difference. Well, how does one make a difference? I mean, obviously you make difference through, through basic research, to, through clinical research, through looking after patients. Um, but, but are there other ways of making a difference? I didn't really know. I sort of knew that what I saw I admired in an academic hospital, but I didn't necessarily want to do that. And somehow I was getting the sense that already I wasn't following the rules and that I was supposed to be a certain kind of a doctor and, and I wasn't playing by the rules. So then I ended up in Chicago. Now, I have no financial disclosures of interest, but I must make a, a public disclosure. And you know, Mark was appalled, I think, and dismayed when I said to him, Mark, my decision to come to the McLean Center 10 years ago was, was very sort of undeliberate. I stumbled upon your site and thought, yeah, this looks like a good idea. And, uh, and you know, now when I hear people about how hard they have thought about doing a fellowship at the McLean Center and, and et cetera, et cetera, and how they've interviewed and prepared, I sort of think, she should never have let me in. But the truth is that my husband was coming to Chicago to do an MBA. I had just finished my oncology training, uh, wasn't quite sure what to do, was sort of looking around for something to do in, the, in Chicago that wouldn't require an American medical license, which I don't possess. 
literally stumbled on the site, thought, this sounds fantastic. It sounds just up my, up my alley. And then uh, decided that in order to live in Chicago, I would need some money. So I figured out, well, how do I get some funding? So I stumbled upon the Fulbright Scholarship, uh, Fulbright Awards, and thought, this sounds like a good idea. I'll, I'll apply for one. All my life has been completely unplanned, I feel. <laughs> Got a Fulbright. So I thought, okay, well, I have an institution to go to. I have money to, to live there. Off I go. And as it turned out, this most casual of decisions, really to accompany my husband and to spend a year somewhere else and figure out what it was that I was going to do, turned out into the most transformative decision of my life. And I, and I really do use that word seriously. Um, I think that being in Chicago for a year, being amongst people like you, many of whom are still here today, which is so fantastic to see, um, really gave me an opportunity to, to reflect, to reflect on what I could bring to the world, what I could bring to the world of medicine. It was also the first place where I heard from people who were writers and who were doctors as well that, that I could write. And people thought, and, and many people said to me, you know, we, we think there's a writer in you and we think you should, you could write a book. And that was incredibly, you know, when, when you're sort of young and trying to figure out your way, it's really important for somebody to be able to say that. So back I went to Australia, um, and, and I thought quite seriously about writing, and although I haven't mentioned it here, my first piece of writing, um, the New England Journal, in fact, put out a notice for uh, looking for writers on medicine and society. And, um, and I decided to enter that, the, the, the speech that I had had many years ago about never being able to write for the New England burning in my mind. So the New England wrote back and said, um, you're not quite what we're looking for, but we like your writing. So would you like to write for us? So this began a very long and continuing relationship with the New England. And, and so if you see my piece in, in forthcoming piece in a couple of weeks' time in the perspective section, you'll know the backstory. So, <laughs> so anyway, so I fulfilled, it had never been my dream to write for the New England, but I got in and, and you know, have published many pieces since, and it's just such a delight. So then I wrote my first book, and the first book is Tell Me the Truth. Um, and it, it's really a book about sort of some of the moral and ethical dilemmas of being an oncologist, what it feels like to sit on the other side of the desk, to give bad news, to constantly give bad news, to deal with that whole dilemma of not extinguishing hope while, while trying to um, prolong life or trying to tell the truth, in fact. Um, and and, I, and it, was, it was quite an honor, in fact, to be shortlisted for a, for a literary prize that was won by, the, by a former prime minister of Australia for his, uh, for his uh, biography that he had written with another author. Malcolm Fraser was a, was a prime minister. And so he sort of won the prize on the, on the night. And I said to Malcolm Fraser, I said, you don't need the publicity, I do. <laughs> and he was very apologetic, lovely man who just died recently. Um, but publishing that book made me b sort of made me realize that I could do it. It was it was an achievement that was um, that was important to me because I'd never quite realized until then how to quite encapsulate my ambition and make something of it. So it was important from a very personal perspective for me to get a book out. My second book, a couple of years uh, later, was, uh, was this one, Dying for a Chat, uh, which was really, it's a, it's a little penguin special. I don't know whether you have them here. They're like 80 pages. They're supposed to be read on a bus or a tram or a train, a uh, one-time read. Um, and they're, they're, they're really kind of cute books. And this book um, is essentially about better end of life, achieving better end of life care by having advanced care directives in place. And it explains, so it describes the story of a woman that I looked after, she was 90 years old, and, and in a story that will be very familiar to you, she sort of went through the labyrinth of the hospital system because nobody ever stopped to say, what would you like? What are your wishes? Not, not so much what would you like or what we can give you, but, but how can we make this work for you? And she died in intensive care, and I made the point that when she died, and she was actually my patient, so there's a lot of mea culpa in this, um, I, I make the point that um, 
Well, we lost the patient. The family was incredibly dissatisfied and couldn't believe, disbelieving that she had died. The bureaucrats came after us. You know, we had spent months in hospital at great cost, just like it is here. The nurses were angry with the doctors because the nurses felt that we should never have uh, given her the kind of care that we did. And, and so I made, and, and you know, and, and it left a bad taste in our mouth because we had lost a patient. So I made the point, well, who's happy? You know, here we have a world-class system. We have spent hundreds and thousands of dollars, if not more, the best medicine in the world, and there is not a single person who's happy. And so that was dying for a chat. And, and incredibly, uh, even to this day, um, it, it, won, it won an award called the Human Rights uh, Human Rights Literature Prize. It's, a, it's an Australian Human Rights Commission, the commission that, uh, that gives out prizes for, for writing. And it was, it was quite interesting because, you know, if you, if you ever look at their website, you'll see the kind of books that they, that, that they award prizes to, often to do with things like anything, ranging from domestic violence to uh, refugee, asylum seeker sort of writing. And I thought, wow, I didn't think I would see a day so soon where talking about end-of-life care and good doctor-patient communication, which lies at the heart of this, could actually be considered a human right and something that is worth awarding a human rights award to. So that was a really, that was a really nice acknowledgement, I felt, for us as a profession, um, for the kind of work that, that we are trying to do. Um, very quickly, these are, my, these are my other two books. The Cancer Companion just came out last month by the UFC Press, which was, which was really lovely and, um, and, and, and so humbling. Um, talking a little bit about my writing career, so after my first book came out, I got a call on Christmas Eve from, um, from the editor of the Melbourne Magazine, which, is, which used to be, it's now defunct, a really glossy, lovely magazine, lots of beautiful advertising and a couple of meaningful articles hidden in there. And the editor says to me, um, he says, um, I'll come clean with you, I haven't read your book, but my wife has and she thinks it's great and she thinks I should hire you. So the power of a spouse who reads. Um, so I was hired. So you know, I thought it was a joke and the Melbourne Magazine was my first sort of big time exposure to, to writing, to writing for a public audience. And so all of a sudden, um, after having written for the New England Journal and in the perspective section for, all, for many years now, I had to figure out, okay, well how do I write for a general audience. And one of my greatest fears when writing, when taking on this job, was that I was also a practicing oncologist in Melbourne. And I kept thinking that people would write to me for second opinions, people would ask me you know, whether their colleague was treating them correctly, et cetera, et cetera, and it would just be a minefield. In all the time I wrote for them, I think it was nearly two years, it didn't happen once. What did happen was hundreds and hundreds of people wrote in, they wrote handwritten letters, spidery handwriting from 80 year olds who wrote to share their story and to say, the column you wrote reminded me of the time when I was ill or my dad was ill or my husband was ill and this is what happened to me. And I was struck, I had never ever thought that reading a column could be so cathartic to other people. You know, when you write, you're always thinking about what you can bring to, you know, how you can do a good job. But you don't, I mean, at least I never thought about the kind of response it would trigger in the public. And it was quite moving and humbling, and you know, people wrote in with practically every kind of experience, you know, pages and pages worth of letters and emails. It was, it was lovely. And I made sure that I responded to every single one of them because I felt that people had taken a lot of time writing to me. So then along came The Guardian um, in 2013. And uh, The Guardian, which used to be the Manchester Guardian, and then it became The Guardian. Um, now it's published in Australia, UK, the US has a Guardian edition. So The Guardian came to Australia. Um, and I decided that I would try my hand at writing for The Guardian, or at least that was my wish, because by that time the Melbourne magazine had folded. Um, and, and so The Guardian kind of was establishing itself in, in Melbourne there. Uh, in Australia, and, and you know, for a, it's, it's actually really difficult to get in anywhere as a writer. And one of the things I learned is that a doctor badge can get you in many places, uh, but it's a little bit difficult trying to get into mainstream media to write, especially for a prominent publication. 
So I kept haranguing the Guardian. I put a, I put a notice on my, uh, on my calendar, and so every few weeks I would ask, can I write for you, can I write for you? So eventually I think they're just tired of me. And they said, well, why don't you submit a piece? Why don't you pitch us something? So I did, and they published it, and then I, a month later, so then I, had to be, I began looking out for cues, because you know, a newspaper thinks, what's in it for me? You know, how will I get more readers? So I've always been a very curious person about the world, and so you know, I would pick out something from a newspaper, or from the headlines, or you know, something about perhaps uh, emergency department waits becoming longer and getting longer in the public hospital system. Oh my God, everything is falling apart. And I would say to the Guardian, let me give you my perspective on why that's happening. And, and that's how initially, you know, I would always be very tentative around them, thinking, well, I don't want them to, I want them to say yes, but I can't ask them too often. So you had to figure out a time where you wouldn't be forgotten, but you weren't being a nuisance. That time roughly was about four to six weeks, I think. <laughs> so then, Christmas is a good time for me. So one day before Christmas, um, the Guardian said to me, um, we're gonna take you on because we get good feedback from your columns, it's something different. And I took a great deal of um, care in writing about things that matter to ordinary people. And you know, I've had a very strong sense that we do such great work and if you look at what we have talked about in the past couple of days, it's wonderful and we have great intentions, they're smart ideas, but unless we bring patients along, pay people along, even before they become patients, that's how we're going to make change. So then I started writing for The Guardian a couple of years ago now, and these are some samples of kind of the, the sort of things that I have picked up on um, and, that I'm, and that I write about. So this one is from June 2015, so just this year. So what happened was, um, if, if there's any oncologist, or you may have heard anyway along the lines, some melanoma drugs came out. And they came out with a great deal of fanfare because for the first time we were seeing that we could not only treat melanoma, but potentially improve, but improve people's survival. Now that is unprecedented in melanoma, which is, which is a nasty disease. So a couple of articles had come out while I was here. Other people had written them sort of celebrating what a miracle drug this had been. The problem, one of the problems with, this miracle, with these miracle drugs was that it didn't work in many people, and in those in whom it worked, there was some progression-free survival benefit. Sometimes there was a small overall survival benefit too. And the cost, one of the drugs, was about, on a per gram basis, something like 400 times more expensive than pure gold. So we're talking about seriously expensive drugs that don't prolong survival for a very long time. And so this whole issue of societal cost. So I was at ASCO in Chicago, and I get, a, I get some desperate calls from The Guardian to say, um, can you write a balanced article? Can you write a piece on this? And I said, I can write a piece on this, but I won't be celebrating the miracle in the same way as, you know, there was breathless press around, around these drugs. And I said, well, hang on, we just need to take a step back and think about whether it's even affordable, for example, in the third world. And you know, in India, in most places, there is no morphine. There is no morphine available for palliative care. How do we reconcile drug availability here in the first world? Um, people are queuing up to, you know, to want to get this melanoma drug approved in somewhere like Australia. How do we reconcile this with global equality, et cetera, et cetera? So I wrote a piece about, you know, as you can see, why I won't be rushing to tell my cancer patients there's a cure. And I brought up all these issues that I was, that I was just telling you about because I think for the public, it's important for people to appreciate the nuances of any drug approval process or why sometimes, for example, we have a, we have a government-funded healthcare system which is incredibly generous, uh, the envy of much of the world, um, but it has rules and regulations around it. So why is that? You know, why, how do we reconcile how we approve drugs, which drugs we use to treat which patients, and so on. So this was a column that was particularly well received, and I think The Guardian was quite relieved <laughs> because I think that the previous columns had been slammed for being a, a bit too breathless in their enthusiasm. This was a particularly, um, uh, a column that was particularly well received and according to The Guardian, who, who, by the way, interestingly, so The Guardian tells you a lot of stuff, a lot of data. They can tell you, obviously, how many people click on your article. So at that point where this picture was taken, there were 41,070 people. 
It can tell you how long people spend on your column. So when they click on it, do they spend five seconds? Do they spend eight seconds? Where did they read up to before they decided to, uh, decided to click off? Um, and so on. So this was a column that apparently wasn't only read the, the whole way, as most of these columns are, but um, featured as the top Guardian article all around the world for three days running. And it goes, to, it goes to show, really, not so much about what about my writing, but about what alternative therapies do, and they polarize people. And so, you know, 2,197 comments till that day, because there are people just fighting with each other about whether alternative therapies work or don't work. Um, but I think, you know, it, it would be very difficult to have that sort of an impact on a patient-by-patient -patient basis talking about the dangers of exotic alternative therapies and of why, as doctors, we are so wary of people who, who, fed, who peddle false hope and false treatments because we are often left to pick up the pieces. This is, an, this is another piece. Um, the, so when I was leaving Chicago, I was pregnant with twins. Unfortunately, I lost them both. I have three healthy children subsequently. But it's, it's obviously, you know, losing a, a pregnancy is, is, uh, affects you deeply on so many levels. And so um, uh, on the 10th anniversary of that loss, I decided to deal with, I, I decided to write a column about it. It certainly wasn't planned. Um, I, I sometimes share personal details about me, but this is probably the most personal column that, that I've ever written. And it was describing the immediate sort of, um, the, the experience of losing the twins and, and, and living the experience as a patient who was also a doctor. And so I talked about a few things, including the fact that the obstetrician who discovered that the twins were dying, he wept. He, he didn't know what to say. And I made the point that it was the first time in my life that I'd seen a doctor cry. A doctor crying with a patient over, over a loss. And it, and, you know, and it changed my world as to what a difference that made to my experience as a patient. And you know, it doesn't mean that, that we must sob and weep with every patient, but it, it really highlighted the, the power of emotion and emotion when a doctor shows it, when a patient is, is, is suffering. And I also wrote in the piece about how there is this whole industry around grieving, isn't there? Uh, you know, when I lost, when my husband and I lost the twins, there was no end of um, well-meaning brochures and books and things that came our way. You know, people were sliding things under our door because everyone in the world thought that you needed counseling to get out of, to get through this. Uh, and, and I made the point that I shunned all of them and I wrote. And it was cathartic and it was my way of getting over it. And it's okay, it's okay not to join the industry of, uh, of grieving and, and not to diminish the good work that people do. But I think often, and especially being an oncologist, I see all the time how cancer patients are meant to do certain things. And there is a certain way of being a patient. And of course, that's not true. And so trying to say to people that even I, you know, as, as a doctor, I decided not to do what the industry told me to do. And I'm OK. And that it's OK to take one's time over grief or whatever it is that you're going through and not live by some kind of mandatory rule. So this was another very popular column for obvious reasons. Uh, the, the Guardian editors are great at bringing at, um, at coming up with the titles, I seldom do. But my favorite um, part about this, uh, which, I, which I wrote to Mark about, was that this was, so this was syndicated very widely. The Guardian is picked up all around the world. This one was on the front page of the North Korean Times. <laughs> and I loved it. I loved the thought of a dictator like Kim Jong-il reading this over his breakfast cereal and sobbing. Think about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, um, so I, I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, very quickly, uh, some other things I have done. So this was a recent protest by, by pediatricians. These are all pediatricians and nurses at the Royal Children's Hospital um, about uh, refugees in detention. And so slowly, I think what my writing has evolved into being is, is talking about topics that are important, that are socially important, but not necessarily medical. 
you know, and one of the things that people often say is, well, should doctors stick to medicine? But I think, you know, as, as doctors, we are still citizens of the world, and we have views, and we have, we have ethical dilemmas, and we have problems when children are in detention or, or, you know, when adults are not looked after, and it's okay to speak up. And so I think that, you know, it's been a wonderful uh, platform, but also a platform of responsibility. A couple of other things, so, so this is, this is a, a lawyer. John Fain is his name, he's very popular in, in Melbourne and in Australia, he's a great presenter. And, um, and I co-host something called the Conversation Hour with him, which is, a, which is an hour on radio where there are guests. Now these guests are not medical, in fact they're seldom medical. Uh, they range from, um, from authors and, uh, and advocates, so there's a the Will Self um, over there, the, tall gangly guy who came in with his e-cigarette. Uh, he's a famous Booker Prize winning author talking about his book. Um, there is a former health commissioner. And so talking about, and so what happens is not only do you talk to these people about what they, they do, but you also have time to talk about medical issues. Um, and, and I use those 10 minutes in public advocacy. So at the start of the conversation hour, which has been a wonderful way once again of reaching a general public. This is just very interesting. So this guy here is a former defense minister of Australia, and uh, I, probably none of you necessarily follow Australian news, but, but an election was fought on the basis of the fact that um, the government of the day accused refugees who were coming into Australia of throwing their children overboard into the ocean in order to seek asylum in Australia. A huge staggering claim that parents would dump their children in the water, but by virtue of that fear-mongering which happened on the eve of the election, the government won by a thumping margin because, you know, it played to, I guess, you know, the fear amongst many people about how asylum seekers and refugees change our way of life. So I asked the defense minister a really simple question when he came in to speak on the conversation hour, um, plugging his book. And I said to him, you know, how did he feel, because he was the one who also kind of sanctioned these claims. Um, and I said, how did you feel as a parent? Um, did you feel as a parent that they stood up to this, this, this claim looked true? And to my astonishment, I would probably never have asked him, he got really hot under the collar and it was a more spirited discussion about, um, about, you know, he didn't answer the question, he was a typical politician, but, you know, defense of, of the whole practice, so it was very interesting. Um, very quickly, uh, this was something very dear to me. So one of the other things I've done through the media is I, I get to do a lot of sort of facilitating and presenting. This girl here is Kate Richards, who if, if any of you want to read an excellent book by a doctor who became a severely psychotic patient, it's called Madness, a Memoir by Kate Richards. So I, Kate and I used to sit in a lecture theater together. We were, we were students till she became psychotic. And obviously, as we have heard, uh, mental illness completely upturned Kate's life. Uh, she subsequently had to leave medicine, and, and, and now she writes. And so I got to interview her, and it was wonderful. It was a sold-out audience, and it was about the lived experience of mental illness, but also from a doctor's perspective. So it was, it, it was a wonderful opportunity once again to tease out the nuances of, of things like that that I probably wouldn't get to do in, in bedside medicine. Very quickly, um, I'll wind up. So, you know, this is just a picture of A.S. Rock, just because you've seen so many pictures of me. It's something to, uh, something to remind you of Australia. People often ask me, you know, what, is, what it's like to write. I thought that was, that was a good, uh, that pretty much sums it up. Before I finish, um, in terms of, you know, we all worry as doctors or nurses, or we all worry about making an impact in the world. And it can be really difficult. I think, you know, if you publish a, journal, a, publish a paper in the journal, you have an impact factor, and you know how many times your article has been quoted, and you get approached, you get approached to talk at, you know, other academic institutions, and so on and so forth. And sometimes I find myself wondering, you know, what's, what sort of impact does a column like this make, or is it sheer indulgence on my part? Make me happy. But here is um, an email that I quickly want to read out to you because I think it really sums up the essence of why I do what I do. Dear Dr. Srivastava, I, sorry, it's just taking me, 
sorry. I just wanted to send you a message to thank you for your columns in The Guardian. I'm a very young patient with stage four rectal cancer involving my liver and lungs. I was highly chemo respondent, but now my time is limited. There's not a lot of writing on cancer that I respond to or that I think really gives me a better perspective on my cancer than I already have after many, many months of living with a death sentence. But your writing always moves me and teaches me something different. I learn about medicine and the healthcare system, and more importantly, the act of living and the reality of dying. I also really appreciate you talking about things from the medical professional side of things. I have the most wonderful oncologist whom I adore, and a surgeon, a liver surgeon, who is dedicated and focused on trying to do the impossible for me. He actually operates on my horrendously screwed up liver to give me a chance. There's always a feeling, however, as a patient, that at the end of the day, the kindness and the affection that your doctors show you is just a thing that they put on to make you feel like they care, because that's what they've been taught at school. But you've taught me that doctors are as human as they seem. It must be an obvious thing to you but one that's easy to forget between the scans and the constant navigation of your body as a complicated problem rather than as a vulnerable human being. I think I'll, uh, I will end there, but I thought that was, a, that was an email that was um, particularly inspiring. My last slide, I think, you know, going back to talking about a difference, I thought, I love that slide. Um, thank you for listening to me. My Twitter handle is Dr. Ranjana.